All right, now that everyone's feeling uh, positive, we'll put something negative up on the screen. <laughs> you know, if anybody's been following this uh, U.S. election business, foolishness maybe is a better word for it, um, you know, it's, it's been pretty discouraging, pretty depressing, pretty negative. And uh, the, the level of viciousness in this campaign is not something that I've ever seen before, and I follow politics very closely. Um, <clears throat> just what these two candidates are saying to each other is bad enough, but then if you start looking at, and I, dis- I discourage you from doing this, but the comment sections on news stories or Facebook posts, boy, oh boy, it is just so uh, so vicious and, and, and just cruel people to each other. Um, it, really, the worst of society is on full display when you start getting into a lot of this stuff. And as Christians, this kind of uh, hate-fueled, hate-filled anger and rhetoric and way of talking is truly unacceptable. It's despised by Christ, and it cannot and must not take hold of Christians. We can't be sucked in to these kinds of attitudes. I always think to... Uh, to when Jesus was, was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter lashes out, right? He's angry, he's, he's upset, he wants to protect Jesus, so he lashes out and he slices off the ear of the Roman soldier. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, No, no, don't do that. If you live by the so- sword, you're going to die by the sword. And then Jesus actually heals the Roman soldier's ear. See, human nature is to get angry and to lash out at people that we're opposed to. But the nature of Jesus and His kingdom is to speak peace and healing and mercy into conflict. Jesus calls His followers to a higher kingdom ethic. Now some of you don't wrestle with anger, I know that. But I'm sure that some of you do struggle with anger. And I know some of you have been wronged in serious ways. And you're struggling with anger or resentment. Well, this morning we're going to talk about stuff that Jesus said about anger. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. We've we've been little by little sort of going here and there and, and doing most of the Sermon on the Mount. So here's a little bit more of it this morning. This is Jesus' great, his magnum opus, okay, and uh, starting at verse 21, Matthew chapter 5. We'll read uh, to verse 26. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. <coughs> Excuse me. So, first thing Jesus says here in this, in this passage, this section of the sermon, is you have heard it said, referring to the Old Testament law, that you shall not murder, right? That's in the Ten Commandments. That's one of the ten big, solid clearly carved into stone commandments for the Jewish people, and and there were hundreds of other commandments and law as well that made up the whole Old Testament law, but those ten were sort of like the core. And so Jesus says, you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder. Yep, they've heard that for sure. And he adds, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. There was a very clear instruction of God in the Bible, I think it's in Deuteronomy, that each community was supposed to have a court 
a local court where people would go and, and, and face judgment and murderers were to appear before that court and face judgment. That's what he's talking about here, that kind of judgment. Also, I mean, sin, so the judgment of God. But really, they have in mind here this local court. Okay, so that's the Old Testament law. You murder somebody, you're going to go to court and be judged, and probably you're going to be executed too. That was the Old Testament way of doing things. Capital punishment. I think in a couple times I might preach on capital punishment, by the way, because Jesus has something to say about that too. Anyway, um, but now here, Jesus adds something. Verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now there's this interesting pattern here of Jesus saying, You have heard it said, but I say. You have heard it said, if you uh, go back a slide there, Kaylee. You have heard it said, but I say. This is a recurring uh, thing through Jesus' teaching. And it's very, very significant what Jesus is getting at here, because Jesus is speaking with authority, great authority. He is demonstrating his authority. He's demonstrating that he's God, that he has this kind of authority. Actually, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, the very end, after he finishes, the sermon's done, it says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The scribes, when they would teach the scriptures, they didn't teach that they could, you know, reinterpret it. They would just teach it and, and, and be subject to it. But Jesus is teaching it as if he has the authority to correct interpretation or even to change interpretation. So what was Jesus doing with these, with these statements? You have heard it said, but I say. Was he contradicting the law? Was he changing the Old Testament? Was he replacing the Old Testament? Was he correcting the Old Testament? Now, that's a long conversation. That's a whole class at seminary to talk about that. And, but in the previous section in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in verses 17 to 20, right before he says this, he talks about the fact that he's not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And that's, again, a whole discussion. But what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, it's important that we understand, is, is not relaxing the law, not correcting the law, not contradicting the law. He's not saying that the Old Testament law got it wrong, and here's my new law to replace it. Um, now, there are actually some cases where he does, it seems, change the Old Testament law, and we will talk about that but what Je- in a later message. But what Jesus is mostly doing here, what Jesus is mostly doing here is teaching the true meaning, the true heart of the Old Testament law. He's getting back to what God really intended. Uh, One author says, Jesus was deconstructing prevailing views regarding the law. So there were popular opinions about how to interpret the law, and he was deconstructing those popular opinions to get back to what God intended when the law was written. He is giving the correct interpretation of the law to a specific group of people who in, in many cases had misunderstood and misapplied the law. Often, the, see what had happened. Often, the Jewish teachers would get so focused on the on the letter of the law, right? The exact words. What does this exactly say? We have to follow this to the exact letter of the law. That they would miss the spirit of the law, the point that God was getting at. Why you're supposed to do this is because of these other more important ethical principles that flow from the heart of God. And so they would get so focused on the letter of the law that they would sometimes miss the spirit of the law. And so Jesus was trying to get them back to the spirit of the law. It's like he's coming and saying, I have authority, because I'm God in the flesh, to reteach the law in a way that truly captures the heart and intention of the God who gave it to you in the first place. Okay. And that's what he's doing here with his teaching on anger. He's saying, you've heard it said... That murder, you're going to be judged. I'm saying, even if you're angry, you're going to be judged. And he's getting at what the point of that original thing was, about hating your brother. So more often than not, Jesus intensifies the commands of God rather than making it easier. He's making it harder, in a sense. So this is what he says, again, verse 22. Uh, 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. <coughs> Excuse me, not just murder, but now anger too. Equivalent to murder. Same level of judgment as a murderer. Now, I have talked to people that aren't believers before. I've, I remember going a couple times to try to do some street evangelism. I wasn't very good at it. Um, but I would try to do some of that. And you go up to people and you ask them some questions like, so, do you believe in God? Do you believe you're going to heaven? Why do you believe you're going to heaven? Right? And then you try to prove to them why they're not going to heaven based on what they believe and how they need Jesus. Anyway, um, often people will say, are you going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, because, I mean, I've never killed anybody. Right? That's what they all, almost always say. It's not like I've killed anybody. As if, like, murdering somebody is, like, the one big thing that automatically that's like, okay, you can do all these terrible things, but if you kill somebody, you cross the line, and that's what determines that you go to hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. And what Jesus is saying here is, brother, listen, if you're even angry with someone, you're a murderer. It's the same thing. It's the same, it's the same uh, caliber of sin. So you can see why we so desperately need a Savior. That's why Jesus came. Now, a point of clarification about anger. All anger is not sin. All anger is not sin. This is really important that we get this. It's clear, uh, actually, from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Or uh, another translation says, In your anger, do not sin. So that means... If you just take that one little verse alone, it means that means it's possible to be angry and not sin. Then obviously not all anger is sin, right? There is one form of anger that is not sinful, and it's sometimes referred to as righteous indignation. Righteous indignation or righteous anger. This is anger not necessarily directed towards an individual out of hatred, but towards a situation. A situation that's evil. It's anger over injustice. Or sin. You look at Jesus, who the Bible says never sinned, right? He was perfect. Did he ever get angry? Let me think. Yeah, he sure did. I can remember a few times when Jesus got angry. Remember him going into the temple and flipping over the tables? He was angry. Why? Because they were sinning in the house of God. Because they were disobeying the law, the the laws of God. They had, they had, they, they were taking advantage financially from, from sacrifices of God's people. And that really ticked him off. And so he was really angry. Righteous indignation. There were times he was angry at the religious leadership, the Pharisees. He would say, woe to you Pharisees. And he would call them names, right? But he was angry at the fact that they were, they were false teachers. They were, they were drawing people away from what God wanted and drawing people away from Christ. He was angry at they, they were misleading the people. Well, that was just. That was justified and righteous. The just wrath of God is another example of righteous indignation, right? God is just and right and totally within His holiness to be angry at sin and to justly judge us for our sin. So there's righteous indignation demonstrated by Christ Himself. We, as the people of God, should also have righteous indignation from time to time. We should be angry about some sin that's out there and some evil. Like, we should be angry about ISIS, for example, and what they're doing. We should be angry about slavery. You know, there are millions of people still in slavery today in the world, especially women in in sexual slavery. Uh, Racism. We should be angry about racism. We should be angry about the oppression of the poor. We should be righteously indignant about heresy in the church, false teachers. We should be righteously angry about idol worship, materialism, humanism. We should be angry about abortion. We should be angry about residential schools, the history of what's happened there, and and so on. There's all kinds of social, political injustice, corruption. And that stuff should make us angry. That stuff's against the, the heart of God. That stuff angers God. It breaks His heart, and it should break our heart. heart. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Does anybody here listen to podcasts? Oh, you guys got to get with the 21st century, man. Podcasts are where it's at. 
Anyway, so I listen to a lot of podcasts, and there's one podcast I listen to called Undisclosed, and it's a, it's a justice podcast. It's about, uh, they look at, they're looking at this one court case where it seems very, very, very likely that uh, this young man was in prison for a crime he didn't commit. So they're trying to exonerate him. They're looking at all the evidence, trying to get him out. And uh, it makes my heart break, and it makes my brain angry that this injustice has been done to this guy. And there's all kinds of people that are in prison today because of just a, a corrupt system that hasn't done the work properly, and, and, and it's, it's, it's terrible. And that's righteous indignation. And righteous indignation rightly leads God's people to change the world. Right? To, it, it should compel us to put our love of God into action by partnering with the Holy Spirit to transform communities and transform countries and transform societies to advance the kingdom of heaven on earth. But now we have to tread really carefully when we engage in righteous indignation because if we're not careful, our anger at evil can translate into anger towards people and we can become proud and have a judgmental, holier-than-thou attitude. And so... I remind you of what Paul said in Ephesians. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. So be careful. Now that's not the kind of anger that Jesus is talking about here though. He's not talking about righteous indignation at evil. What Jesus is talking about here is personal, hate-filled anger toward another person. You go to the next slide, please, Kaylee. The, um, the Greek word here for anger that Jesus uses is the word orge, which means uh, not a quick moment of anger, not a sudden outburst, but an ongoing, burning anger. Anger that you are slow cooking inside of you. Anger that is teeming inside of you and, and then sometimes emerges from you and, la- and you lash out at people. But it's this it's like a hatred kind of anger towards somebody. And if you have that kind of anger, this is what Jesus says, you're guilty of the equivalent of murder, liable to judgment. And then he takes it up a notch in verse, again in verse 22. He says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. That word insults in the Greek is raka. This is the only place in the New Testament that that word uh, shows up, raka. What does it mean? Raka basically means, uh, it's like a word that's an insult like like airhead or empty head. It means that you have no brain in your head. You're just an idiot, okay? That's what raka means, empty head. And so what Jesus is saying here, you know, this is a little bit worse than anger. So you've got this anger inside of you, but now that anger has, has come out of you verbally. You have lashed out. You've hurled some insults. You've made some comments online. You've sent an email or a text that maybe you shouldn't have sent. And Jesus says, you're going to be liable to the council. So first he said liable to the judgment, meaning a local court. Then he says liable to the council, meaning the Sanhedrin or the Supreme Court of Israel. Then he takes it up another notch, and he says, verse 22, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. When I was a youth and I read that, I used to think, okay, uh uh-oh, if I say the word, if I call someone a fool, that particular word, does that mean I'm going to hell? Because that's maybe the literal interpretation of that. But no, that's not what exactly Jesus is saying. The point he's making here is that if you are calling someone a fool, he's sort of implying here that it's one step further from just making rude or nasty comments towards someone, hurling some insults. Now you are attacking the person's very moral character. Character assassination. Slandering their reputation. Dehumanizing that person. Jesus says, you'll be liable to the hell of fire, in the Greek, to the, liable to the fire of Gehenna. Gehenna was a garbage dump outside the walls of Jerusalem. 
and it was always burning, and it was stinky, and it was, it was just really, really gross. It was seen as everything that was bad in Jerusalem, and they, and they would burn bodies there, and they would burn garbage there, and human waste, and all sorts of stuff. It was really, really gross. And that word Gehenna, to rep- that's the name of this garbage dump, that's the word that we translate as hell. That's the word that they use to describe what hell is going to be like. So truly, when we look at this, right, as I read that through, I think, okay, I'm guilty. You know, I might not struggle with anger on a regular basis like some people do, but I've been angry. I've insulted people. I've called people the equivalent of airhead. I have done some character assassination on people before in my life. I'm guilty. Hell is justified, according to the Word of God. I'm a murderer. One uh, author says this, the hatred, if you go to the next slide, the hatred that causes one person to hurl insults is the same hatred that causes another to commit murder. The attitude of the heart is the same, and it's, the ad- it's this attitude that makes a person morally guilty before God. Now, here's the good news for Christians. As Christians, through the blood of Christ that covers us, our sin, we don't need to worry that anger or these things are going to disqualify us for heaven. It won't. Jesus' blood covers us. His grace is greater than our sin. If you're not a Christian, though, this is bad news. Because it's one more sin that does disqualify you from heaven. We need Jesus. We need Him. We need His forgiveness and His grace. That's what this reminds me. So now we look at the practical application of this in verse 23. So Jesus kind of, he gives the bad news, right? If you're angry, if you lash out, if you do character assassination, you're going to be judged. You're equivalent of a murderer. That's the bad part. Now he gives some practical wisdom here. So, he says, so, if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So if you have something against someone or someone has something against you, there is some conflict between you and another person. Jesus says, be reconciled. Be reconciled. Don't even bother doing your religious duty. Don't bother going to church and all that stuff until you've dealt with this animosity between you. Anger affects your spiritual life. Anger affects your spiritual life. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter's talking about the sin of anger, and it says, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And he's talking about anger in this situation. Harboring resentment and anger and hatred toward another person seriously hinders your spiritual life. It robs you of God's blessing and power. You are not going to be able to be the person God wants you to be or do the things that He wants you to do for His kingdom if you're caught up in this sin. So deal with it. Be reconciled. And deal with it quickly. Put out the fire before it grows into something much bigger. How much bigger? Jesus even warns it could land you in court, maybe prison, maybe having to pay legal settlements and so on. Verse 25. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you paid the last penny. So the teaching of Jesus is clear. Do what you must to put out the flames of hostility, hate, and anger. Reconciliation, forgiveness, mercy, grace, patience, and love must be the themes of our relationships with others, even if the other person doesn't deserve it. That's a hard thing to swallow sometimes. Even if the other person doesn't deserve it. You know, Jesus taught us to love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do not repay evil with evil. It's not our job to try and make others see our point of view. And act accordingly. It's our job to love and forgive. Like Jesus. 
And sometimes, and not all the time, but sometimes, to keep our mouths shut. When Jesus was being led off to his death, I always remember this, you know, he had opportunities to defend himself. Pilate would say, Jesus, what do you have to say for yourself? Stand up for yourself. And it says that Jesus remained silent. He went off like a lamb to be slaughtered. Ecclesiastes 3.7 says there is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. There is a time to keep silent. And not all the time. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you always need to just take everything that people are given to you. Um, but there are times when we need to remain silent. And what Jesus is causing us here to ask ourselves is this. Number one, is my anger justified? Do I have a healthy, normal anger, frustration at a situation of evil or wrongdoing, or have I taken that anger a little farther where now I am slow cooking it inside of me, feeding it, fanning the flames of anger and hatred towards another person in my mind? Two, am I speaking too much? Am I lashing out at this person when I would do better to tame my tongue and work toward reconciliation? Number three, am I bad-mouthing them? Committing character assassination. Maybe I need to take the log out of my own eye before I go around pointing out the specks in other people's. So the question is, are we going to be like Peter in that situation when Jesus was being arrested, who drew his sword and lashed out at the enemy? Or are we going to be kingdom of heaven people, kingdom of God people like Jesus, who spoke peace into the situation And brought healing. Spoke peace. And brought healing. I think Peter learned his lesson that day. When Jesus told him that. uh, To put his sword away. Because he later wrote. In his first letter. First Peter. Instructions to the church. On this same topic of anger. And we referenced a little bit of it earlier. But I'm just going to read this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. There are several practical things here that Peter suggests that would be helpful for someone who is struggling with anger. <clears throat> and if you happen to be one of those people right now who is struggling with anger in your life for some reason, uh, your homework, you have homework. Your homework is to read this passage again when you go home and again and again. And again, and study it. Look at what Peter is saying here. Read it every day if you have to. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. He says, finally, all of you, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. On the contrary, bless. Bless people. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and Pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Amen. So Jesus said, Blessed, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, how do we effectively do these things and be these kind of people? Through the help of the Holy Spirit, that's how. In John uh, chapter 15, Jesus tells us to abide in the vine, to abide in the vine, to be clinging to Jesus. John Piper says it this way regarding this command to to not be angry. He says, Jesus' demand is not something we can do in our own power. I agree with that. Becoming angry is not necessarily a choice we make. Yeah, I see that too. It is a fruit of on the branch of our lives. The question is, what vine are we a part of, and whose fruit will we bear? 
The demand of Jesus not to be angry is therefore also a demand that we abide in him as our vine. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So come to Jesus and stay close to Jesus through prayer and the word, and fellowship, and worship and the spiritual disciplines and, and so on. Abide in him. Abide in him. And you will bear much fruit. And what kind of fruit? The fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit will be in your life. And here they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this teaching today. It's one of those hard teachings, again, where we are reminded, God, that we are sinful people. Thank you that you offer us grace and mercy and forgiveness through the blood of Christ. And we claim that today. We need that. And Lord, as we seek to be kingdom people, we pray, God, that you would produce this fruit in our lives. That as we seek your face, that as we seek to do your will, Lord, that you would help us in this area of anger and hatred towards others, that you would give us that fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's how we want to be defined, God. When we look at what's happening in the States with the election and the kind of hatred and anger that we see there and that tone of speaking that dehumanizing that's taking place between candidates and between American citizens. Lord, our heart grieves for the church who is caught up in this. And the witness, that, the, the negative witness that's, that's resulting from these things. And Lord, we don't want to have that here in our lives, Lord, as, as we deal with anger and frustration. We want to take the high road. We want to take the way of Christ. We want to speak peace and bring healing into situations of conflict. And so, Lord, may that be true for us. Help us to that end, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.